between politics and separately. In this course, we're going to seek to unpack those, unmistake, those mistaken beliefs of the movement, including the myth of American exceptionalism. We will seek to understand how Christian nationalism came to be and why it is such a threat to our democracy and to our Christian witness. We'll explore why these patriot churches are an affront to both the Constitution and the Gospel's values of love, justice, equality, dignity, and empathy. For instead of loving our neighbor as Jesus taught, their ideology harms the neighbor, especially those of other ethnic or religious traditions. At its core, it is another form of white supremacy. Christian nationalism has been present at one form or another throughout our nation's history. But until modern times, it has been relatively benign. Its origin begins with the myth of American exceptionalism, the belief that America was God's chosen nation, and that because of our destiny with greatness, we were ordained to be the number one nation in the world. This myth was perpetuated by religious and political leaders in the English colonies of North America. The New World was likened to Cana, the promised land of the Old Testament, and the doctrine of discovery, issued first by Pope Nicholas V in 1455 and later proclaimed by Pope Alexander VI in 1493, gave American, European explorers the right to claim and exploit any land not inhabited by Christians. Now take a look at this doctrine of discovery, which really is the basis, in many ways, of white supremacy and the myth of American exceptionalism that was brought to this country. It says to invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Sartan. Do you know what that means? Saracen? Saracen. Saracen. They were um, the, the common European label for people from the East. Okay, so anybody that's not European, basically, and pagans whatsoever, and other enemies of Christ, wheresoever placed in the kingdom, dukedoms, da 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 da. And it says, and to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery. This, this is a document, a papal bull issued by Pope Nicholas. And then it goes on at the end, it says, and convert them to his and their use and profit. <laughs> so to convert the people and the land to the use and profit of the European. And you know who this is. Um, this gave the right to European explorers to then exploit and conquer any land not inhabited by Christians. And it gave credence to America's sense of manifest destiny and provided the rationale for both the genocide of Native Americans as well as the slavery of non-white persons on whose back this nation was built. It was taught that the Anglo-white race was superior and intended to be God's instrument of salvation for all others. <laughs> Historian Roxanne Jabbar Ortiz came out with a powerful book this year called Not a Nation of Immigrants, Settler Colonialism, White Supremacy, and a History of Erasure and Exclusion. <clears throat> In it, she reminds us that the United States was founded as a settler state from its inception and spent the next 200 years at war against the native nations in conquering the continent. And this gives you a map of where all the various nations, indigenous nations, were already in place in this country when the Europeans came to America. It wasn't that it wasn't populated. Um, there were nations of Native Americans that had been here for centuries. She goes on to say, when the white man arrived in North America, there were around 12 million indigenous Americans of various tribal nations. 
get this, by 1890, only 248,000 were dead. From 12 million to 248,000. That's genocide. The myth of American exceptionalism has come to include a revisionist version of history of our nation's founding, claiming that most, if not all, of the <coughs> colonial politicians were Christian and based the Declaration <coughs> of Independence on Christian principles. The myth goes on to include that America is favored and the Christian God has always been our policy. And we'll look at these themes more carefully in the next two weeks. We have much to repent for regarding our nation's past, and I would contend that the big lie is not just about the 2020 presidential election. It is the denial that we are a racist culture that was founded on the premise of white privilege and white supremacy. In fact, there is a movement today among at least half of the state legislatures to prohibit the teaching of black history. I was uh, encouraged that the state Supreme Court in Florida recently overturned that ruling that prohibited <coughs> the state colleges from teaching black history. Um, This denial of our history, what our history really is about, uh, has led to suffering, division, hate, prejudice, and injustice on so many levels. In his new book, Christianity Corrupted, A Scandal of White Supremacy, Dr. Jermaine Marshall recounts how the founders of America were European colonists, colonialists, and enlightened thinkers that equated whiteness with perfection. This initial basis for white supremacy was the result of racial classifications of the 16th and 17th century that considered white Europeans as culturally and racially superior. Race was constructed to keep all other races subjected to one race through oppression. Race was a political concept, not a biological one. European culture and religion became associated with whiteness. Marshall goes on to suggest that the real scandal of this Enlightenment theory of race was that its roots were to be found in Puritanism and Anglicanism. These Christian faith traditions became a major catalyst for white supremacy and white privilege. It was taught that a non-white person would achieve a form of whiteness through baptism, being washed in the white blood of Jesus. This became problematic, however, when many slaves turned to Christianity and most were not welcome in the white churches. Consider this, the image of God that we have grown up with, most of us, that fosters this myth of white supremacy. For most of us, most of us it's the white Northern European Jesus, not a Palestinian Jesus like the one depicted on the right, this is done by a, by a Dutch photographer based on AI research, what Jesus probably looked like. And we don't have time to kind of go into the differences, but we have the colonizer Jesus on the left and the historical Jesus on the right. ELCA pastor Lenny Duncan, author of Dear Church, writes, White supremacy is a systemic force in this world that defies God. And he blames part of this on the fact that we have worshipped a white Jesus in this country for too long. He says, I believe the only hope for mainline Christianity is to dismantle white supremacy, first in our pews and then in our communities. This is the call of discipleship with the rise of xenophobia, racial violence, and nationalism in the United States. It's hard to deny the roots of the real hurt that people of color experience in this system. White supremacy, he says, is antithetical to the gospel. 
concept of Christian nationalism gained steam with the marriage of the fundamentalist leaning churches and the political right. President Jimmy Carter had been favored by the evangelicals because of his Baptist faith, and he received their overwhelming support in the election of 1976. The political strategist for Ronald Reagan saw an opportunity to extract that support by using the wedge issue of abortion in the following election. It wasn't that the politicians cared that much about abortion, but they believed it could swing the election in their favor. It was, of course, only one of a number of factors, but it marked the beginning of the Republican Party embrace of conservative Christian causes. Now, I'm not here to talk about your politics. I'm just here to kind of share the facts um, as various individuals have researched and shared. Interestingly enough, after Reagan's election, Billy Graham was interviewed by Parade Magazine, and he offered this cautionary note. I don't want to see religious bigotry in any form, he said. It would disturb me if there was a wedding between the religious fundamentalists and the political right. The hard right has no interest in religion except to manipulate. He was a prophet in his own time. The internet gave Christian nationalism along with other ideologies opportunity to flourish. Religious and political leaders found it easy to reach and influence scores of people using social media, winning them over to their cause. In the process, various conspiracy theories were promoted on social media. <clears throat> the culture wars of the past 10 years have only strengthened their resolve and begin to more deeply divide the nation politically and religiously. Lately, conspiracy theories have been used by the right-wing media and talk show hosts to both frighten and mobilize voters. And the goals of these conspiracy theories, number one, to overcome a powerful evil force. They say that this is a battle between good and evil. Two, to suggest that we are involved in some cosmic struggle. And three, to imagine a coming tragedy such as a major race war. You may have heard of the great replacement theory that believes that liberal elites are replacing white citizens. Not only will white people lose their position of privilege in our society, the conspiracy suggests that this will eventually result in the extinction of the white race and the fall of Western civilization. And this happens through immigration and interracial marriage and conception. Fear is being used as a political weapon to stir people up. In their latest book, Taking America Back for God, researchers Andrew Whitehood and Samuel Carey reveal some interesting data. They find that a sizable portion of Americans pine for Christianity's former prominence in American civic life, and feel that threat, their faith is threatened and being marginalized. They fear their values will no longer be dominant, and their freedom to preach their moral values and share their religion could be outlawed. Close to 50% of the population support the notion of Christian nationalism and believe that Christianity and civil society should be intimately intertwined. Of course, that the government should now guarantee that Christianity would be the primary religion. While civil religion has traditionally held that the creator demands our exemplary fairness and faithful stewardship, the Christian nationalist tradition, by contrast, views God's demands more in terms of allegiance to our national, almost ethnic Christian identity. It suggests that we should fear God's wrath for any unfaithfulness as a nation. 
Blankett and Perry reveal some interesting findings from their research. Number one, Americans who, are, who embrace Christian nationalism are one, less likely to believe in the importance of social and economic justice. Two, tend to be mistrustful towards those not of their tribe, native born, Christian, and white. They believe whites are as likely as blacks to be abused by the police. The society they wish to live in is one of traditional families with men and women in their proper roles. And who are more likely to create, support, and maintain social boundaries that exclude non-Christians from full participation in American civic life. Uh, I have some books out on the table you can thumb through if you want to that, that are the basis of, of what I'm sharing with you. Particularly of interest is Whitehead and Perry's uh, very specific and thorough research that they've done on this topic. They're inter interviewing thousands of people across this country. Christian nationalism is indeed a threat to a pluralistic democratic society. As Supreme Court, Jer Ju Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackmun once remarked, a government cannot be premised on the belief that all persons are created equal when it asserts that God prefers some over others. Christian nationalist ideology is fundamentally focused on gaining and maintaining access to power. It seeks to ensure that one particular group with a specific vision for the country enjoys privileged access to the halls of power and has the ability to make the culture into its own image. It fuses national and religious symbols and identities in an attempt to legitimate its desires for the country. There's no room for disagreement or compromise. It demands complete allegiance and even worship. So you're either with us or against us. It's kind of the model. Presiding Bishop Elizabeth Eaton, whom you'll hear from next week, um, I'm going to be sharing with you a webinar that she and Bishop, uh, Presiding Bishop Michael Curry did on the, the topic of Christian nationalism. Elizabeth Eaton claims that Christian nationalists are breaking the first two commandments. So let's review them from the perspective of Luther's catechism. You remember this, right? From confirmation. You shall fear and have no other gods. I'm going to ask you to repeat with me the answer. We are to fear, follow, trust, and worship God above all things. And number two, you shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God. For you are to fear and love the God, so that we do not curse, swear, lie, or deceive against God's name, but instead use that very name in every time of need, or call on, pray to, and give thanks to God. So she feels that Christian nationalism is, in effect, breaking these first two commandments. That it's putting our patriotism and our flag above God and God's mission for us in this world. And I'll explain that a little bit further. As Christians, we need to consider what or who we worship and what kind of a God we what or who we worship, and what kind of a God we worship. Theologian Brian McLaren suggests that we are called to follow the loving, nonviolent Jesus of the gospel instead of the conquering Jesus of colonialism and empire. He writes, The God image by Jesus exerts no dominating supremacy. In Christ, we see an image of God who is not armed with lightning bolts, but with a basin and a towel, who spewed not threats, but good news for all, who rode not a war horse, war horse but a donkey, weeping in compassion for people who did not know the way of peace. In Christ, God is supreme, but not in the old discredited paradigm of supremacy. 
God is rather supreme healer, supreme friend, supreme lover, supreme life giver, who self empties in gracious love for all. The so-called weakness and foolishness of God are greater than the so-called power and wisdom of human genius. In the aftermath of Jesus and his cross, we should never again define God's sovereignty or supremacy by analogy to the kinds of this world who dominate, oppress, subordinate, exploit, scapegoat, and marginalize others. Christians who reject Christian nationalism point out that its tenets directly contradict the dictates found in the Bible especially the command of Jesus to love the neighbor, whoever they may be. The kingdom of God, where we are to love and serve others, is broader and more diverse than the narrow world of white Christian nationalism. It is bigger than any nation or even any faith. In fact, the fusing of a national identity with a particular kind of Christianity can harm our witness to the gospel for it depends on human traditions rather than on Jesus Christ. And I have to say that I'm proud of the ELCA for some of the statements that they've come out with recently. In 2016, a resolution repudiating the doctrine of discovery, and there's a task force at work about what that means and how to bring that into congregations. Um, former Bishop Jessica Christ from Montana is uh, leading that charge. She is working with uh, the Native American people uh, in, uh, in a task force, putting together a, kind of a program to bring into congregations so that they can really wrestle with what does this mean and how do we, how do we move beyond uh, the damage that's been done by the doctrine of discovery. In 2019, 2019, at the Churchwide Assembly, there was a statement condemning white supremacy and an apology to people of African descent. You can go to the ELC website and, and take a look at those documents. Um, in my book, um, I actually have a, re a reprint of the apology to people of African descent. It's in the appendix. We should reject the notion that in order to be truly American, one must be Christian. And in order to be truly Christian, one must be an American. Uh, St. John reminds us that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Christ died for the whole world, not just for America. And God loves all people, not just those of our tribe or faith traditions. The picture that you see here is from the tour called Reawaken America that's been going on um, prior to the 2020 elections. And this is their logo, His Glory on the Road. Uh, we're going to talk about that some more in the last session, but what has been particularly disturbing to me is that this rally has fused religious symbols and traditions. Um, they use uh, praise songs at the beginning of the rallies. They've been doing baptisms at the rallies. Um, and all in the name of Jesus. And that God is commanding people to rise up in a militant way if necessary to take back this nation for God. Um, we must confront a rising ideology that is rooted in America's original sin, which is the sin of white supremacy. The old ideology is undergirded by the old heresy with a new name, white Christian nationalism. And I would say that white Christian nationalism is the single greatest threat to, demo to democracy in America, but also to the integrity of our Christian witness. The great replacement theory and white Christian nationalism are promoting a us versus them attitude by planting fear of the racial other 
and asserting that white Christians must take back America for God by any means necessary. Many long for a theocracy when their brand of Christianity may be the official religion of the land. It is an ideology clothed in religious language and religious symbolism that has become a political strategy. Michael Curry, presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, warns us, if you exclude people, then it is not Christian. Christianity is about the way of Jesus. As Christians, we are called in baptism to follow Jesus in a way of love, not some ideology that promotes fear and hatred for others. The Jesus of the gospel calls us to love our neighbor, regardless of race or religion, and to stand up for religious freedom, equal opportunity, and justice for all people. Next week, you'll be hearing from Bishop Eaton and Michael Curry in a webinar called Democracy and Faith Under Siege, Responding to Christian Nationalism. Questions, comments, that's a lot for you to uh, absorb and, and reflect on. So, I guess, Paul, um, I, I guess one thing that, um, okay, I guess I'm trying to think to characterize my concern here, so I, I guess the teachings of the Christian nationals here and so on are seen to be off base to me. And the, the presiding bishop too about the uh, discrepancies in in their representation of Christianity and what it what it should be. But there's always been a lot of sects out there that um, you know that have Christianity wrong, okay, and and um, and yet we don't identify them as being a threat to democracy. So I guess my you know kind of my my question or point that I would make here and stuff like that, what makes the current Christian nationalists a, uh, a threat to democracy and how they're different than just being off base religiously here? Well, it's because it's become a political ideology. Right. I mean, it's, it's a political strategy now. Um, that's, that, and you know, I said in the research, over about 50% of the country now has bought into that. Um, and that damages our Christian witness. I mean, not just mm -hmm. the future of democracy in this country, but our Christian witness. Mm -hmm. If that's what it means to be a Christian, is to adopt that kind of ideology. Um, and, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why we have so many of our young people in this country that don't want to have anything to do with organized religion. <laughs> Because that's what they see promoted as Christianity. And see, if that's Christianity, I don't want any part of it. You know, I might believe in God, but I don't believe in that kind of it. And I guess what I see is it's the combination of yes. the erroneous statements of Christianity with the political movement that in order to really threaten democracy, you have to have I guess a, uh, an authoritarian type political system, okay, to eliminate the democratic decision making and control in our government. And it's, I guess my, my point is it's, it's that combination is what is really the current way of things and is different from the past. Exactly. And I said that many people that are in, in favor of American or white Christian nationalism also say that they're in favor of a theocracy. And that, that's where you have the danger, the danger and the damage to democracy. If you have an authoritarian government that can tell you what to believe and how to believe, um, then we have, we have lost our democratic principles. You know, the freedom of religion, we're going to talk about that quite a bit in, in the last session. But it is, it is a threat to democracy because it's this, this fusion again of using Christianity as a as a weapon. Um, 
for for, for power to, to to gain or maintain power. Yes, please. Yeah. How do the, the uh, Christian nationals deal with the First Amendment, which requ requires separation of church and state and freedom of religion, and also the fact that Jefferson was a ne deist and not a Christian? <laughs> well, we're, again, we're going to talk about that in the last session, but I'll, I'll give you one hint. Um, there, in fact, I'll, I'll give you a kind of a preview because I'm going to start with this quote uh, in two weeks. But the... Um, I'm not blanking on her name. She's a, a congresswoman from, from Colorado. Oh, Bober. No. Bober. 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 Yes, thank you. Thank you. In fact, they're doing a recount because she's only 500 votes ahead of her opponent. But she's come right out and said there is no separation between uh, church and state. And in fact, it was the intention of our founding fathers that. The church should be in control of the state. I mean, she, she doesn't know her history. Uh, and, and then, unfortunately, there are voices like that, and Marjorie Taylor Greene and others are promoting those kinds of falsehoods. Yeah. This, this is uh, helping me grieve the funeral of my cousin yesterday, the fourth under 30 cousin to die of opiates in about a year. So my family's strewn across the United States. And, you know, this is decim this, this type of work is decimated, not work, I'm, I'm talking about these kind of ideas have decimated the white people I know in the South, my family in the South, in the Midwest. I mean, so I mean, in our Christian spirit, we need to grieve for a lot of the white folks that espouse a lot of these things, yeah, they're, yeah. they're getting decimated. And I gotta tell you, I've lost, the average age in my family, I would say is about 50 to 60 years old. You know? so, and I, I wanna be clear, and I agree with yeah, you. Yeah, no, and I, I love your work, this is really, I understand, I'm just saying on the other side, let's have some compassion. Too. Oh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And I, you know, I do not disparage the, yeah. the people that believe this. Right, right. I'm talking about the leaders right here right. of this movement right. that right. know better right. Right. or should know better. Right. That's clear. Thank you. Oh. Yes, I'm just wondering how you're seeing uh, this, manif this nationalism manifest itself in the Pacific Northwest, which typically, you know, if you believe surveys or read surveys, if they're accurate, that we live is in the, the least churched part of the country and seems and, you know, one way to look at that is that we may be less susceptible to that merger because there are simply fewer people who are driven by a Christian, that type of Christian ideology in our region. No, I think that's partly true. Um, that, that the Northwest and the Northeast, which are now considered, in fact, in, when the first surveys were done uh, about 20, 25 years ago, uh, the Pacific Northwest was the leader in terms of the, being the nun zone. That means that most people would would say we're not affiliated with any uh, particular faith tradition, you know, in terms of you know organized religion. Not that they they would say we're spiritual, but we're not religious. It's kind of the theme. Well, now the the north the northeast has kind of surpassed us to a degree. I'm talking about you know Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont kind of thing. But so those two kind of areas I'd say probably are least susceptible. Not that there aren't pockets uh, that would buy into this, um, but probably the least susceptible. But there, but there are other areas, in, and I, would, I, I think that probably the Bible Belt uh, is very susceptible to this, again, because it's this merger of, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a Christian, and you know I, I believe in Jesus, and if I see the flag and Jesus together, that's great, but what they don't understand are the nuances about what it really, what it really means. Uh, so I hand over here, and then I'll bring. So I, I was just going to earlier you talked about the um, the damage to our faith, and I think we just recently had the confirmation kids over to our house for dinner, and in the conversation somebody asked, "Would you let your?" Classmates know that you are a Christian. Would you confirm someone? And they said, 
we not are we not better? And they go, why? Well, I I don't want to be associated with that. And, okay. And my what well, the popular notion of being a Christian right. is, yeah. yeah. And I'm not that kind of a Christian. Yeah. 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 And the same thing with my twenty-something son is like when when Trump was elected and and fully supported by white evangelicals. He's like, why would I want to be associated with that? Right. Yeah. Okay. So I think we've lost a whole generation because of it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Well, that, that again is the threat to the Christian witness. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and I want to just maybe give a footnote there is that not all, um, let me just say, not all Republicans are Christian nationalists, for example. Sure. Um, you know, there's probably some Democrats that are Christian nationalists. It's not really party based, so I'm not talking about you know, Republican or Democrat. Um, and I have to say, my uh, my wife's cousin, for example, she's married to a, a Baptist minister, um, and I'm going to tread what tread dangerously into politics, but uh, but she she saw uh, Donald Trump for who he was. She said, I can't support him. I'm a Republican. I've been a lifelong Republican and I'm proud of being a Republican. But she said, I just I cannot support the man because of his values and the way he treats other people. Uh, that's not my, you know, my image of a Christian. Um, so I think there are discriminating and discerning people in both sides uh, that can see through this. But unfortunately, there are so many that being blindsided and sucked in. Go um, over here. Yeah. I was just wondering if any of your um, in your bibliography or whatever um, has spoken to some connecting it with kind of the rise of nationalism in Germany in the 30s, you know, of if anything that we've learned from that as far as how how rhetoric can be, you know. Yes, and, and I, again. Because it's hard to sit here for 45 minutes and not talk about the rise of nationalism yeah, well, yeah, well, in Germany. Yes, yes. And Christian, and the Lutherans and Catholics. Yeah, and, and I'm going to touch on that a little bit more in the last session. Oh, great. But, but yes, I mean, there's a dangerous uh, and, and, and kind of uh, really eerie com you know, comparison when you think about Germany in the late 30s. And what's going on in America today? Um, I belong to a, a Bonhoeffer Society, and we have uh, monthly um, webinars on, online. And you know, we say this is a Bonhoeffer moment. Uh, some of the things that Bonhoeffer was facing in Germany in the 30s and early 40s um, is exactly what we're going through here in the United States. You know, it's, it's really chilling. And I'll, we'll touch on that a little bit in the last session. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, I have two quick things. One, yeah. about uh, the Nazi zone and the Pacific Northwest. You have to remember, it's King County. Right? You go up to Arlington, uh, east of the map. Well, even like on the west side, it is not the same. I mean, we have, we have congregations preaching white nationalism at our doorstep. Oh, I'm sure. Yes, um, I'm sure. That's the same. Yeah. Um, but I'm really curious of you, like, what is with the silence of the mainline, non-nationalist, Christian denominations, church bodies? You have a couple of things up here from ELCA in 2016 and 2019, but it's 2022. And this is a huge problem. I don't understand where the voice of you know, authority went. Well, that's that's why Elizabeth Eaton and Michael Curry and, and other leaders are speaking out against it um, and leading the charge. The Christians Against Christian Nationalism, I think I mentioned this, is really um, a brainchild of the American Baptist Commission on Religious Liberty. And they, they have been speaking out against this now since about 2017. Um, and many of the religious leaders, like Bishop Curry and Bishop Eaton, uh, there's a document, I think, that, uh, did I get copied? 
So on which side you have the uh, bibliography of the books that I've been using to put this material together. On the other side you have you have this document. And this is online. And uh, the encouragement is that every congregation should be promoting this document to help people become aware of what's happening. And Bishop Beaton and Bishop Curry and others have signed up for this. Of course, the challenge is, and that's that's why your pastor had asked, had asked me to come and talk about it. Because not not enough conversations going on in congregations about this issue. Yeah. So you know, I agree that, that we need to be talking about this more. But it's one year old. I'm embarrassed yeah. that we can't have a strong voice yeah. of what our faith means to us yes. and yes. 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 what our country needs. Yes. yes. Because I, I'm absolutely. I've got to, I've got to say something. We she mentioned Germany. <laughs> I'm German now. My take on Hitler and Germany and nationalism there is taken from a book that we read by Peter Klaus at Klaus Johannes on Zimmerman. Germany got its idea from us. That's right. When you ask how we treat the blacks, they got it from us. Hitler, Hitler. I'm sorry, I'm very, yeah. as you can tell, very passionate about this. Thank you. No, we used to use the seat in this country. Yeah. Yeah. America's getting away with the black people. Yeah. 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 Or what are they doing to engage white nationalists in dialogue? Mm -hmm. I, I understand that the statements against Christian nationalism are uh, essential. But if it's only statements against, then isn't that simply kind of feeding into polarization? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm curious, who's doing things to actually engage these people who have a lot in common with us, they're Christians, and they're white, and they're citizens, or residents. Sure, sure. So who's engaging uh, folks in dialogue to diffuse? Yeah, no, that's a good point. The, that's that's a really good point. That leads and to violence. I'm going to wrap, this will be the last question, because we have to wrap up and get, get, up, get to church, but yeah. um, <laughs> very good comment. And I'll, and two responses. Number one is, I think what they're doing is terribly important to open people's eyes about what's happening. You know, that's the first thing. Number two is there are a number of organizations, um, and, I'll sh and I'll share with you some of those organizations in, in my next uh, lecture. Um, Braver Angels is one of them. Uh, there's a Seattle chapter for Braver Angels. Uh, and uh, there's, a, there's a, probably about at least a half a dozen organizations across the country that are engaging in dialogue and promoting dialogue to try to help bridge the divide. So there are those, and, and, and there's some, they're doing some great work. Great, and we'll hear about those. You'll hear about those in the last session. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks for today. <laughs> if you're interested in a copy of the book, just let me know.